Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to this week's uh, webinar session, uh, Transforming the Future of Land Management. My name is Matthew Morris, and I'm a land steward with the Duchy of Cornwall, and I'm your host uh, today, along with Tim Hopkin, who is the founder of the Land App. So welcome to episode six. Uh, the theme today is business demand for resilient ecosystems. Uh, in some respects, this is the most important part of the puzzle. Ensuring a sustainable and long-lived connection between business and the environment will mean that environmental improvements endure far, be far beyond a single initiative. The post-coronavirus business environment is likely to be very difficult. It's clear there are gonna be some huge funding gaps the Wildlife and Countryside Link, a coalition of more than 50 environment and wildlife groups in England, recently warned in a report that the UK environment charities are facing a dramatic loss of income. This will have an impact on their ability to care for land, protect wildlife and tackle climate change, as well as nature's decline for years to come. Business there ha therefore has an important role to play. We should be looking far beyond the polluter pays principle which is more than a hint of finger pointing about it. It should be about business doing something positive. Locally, it's about how business is working with, not against its local environment. And globally, it should be about how business can contribute positively to the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals. Land management does, of course, have a huge part to play. Put simply, not every business has the luxury of land but every landowner and land manager has the potential to connect with business. How this is achieved and more importantly managed, we will hopefully hear more about today. So just a quick bit of housekeeping, just as ever your camera and microphone will remain off throughout the session. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom to ask questions of our speakers and you can vote up any popular questions which helps me pick the most important ones to ask our speakers. And quite importantly, as two of our speakers today are called Andy in the Q&A, please do make it clear if yours is a question for Anglian Water or a question for Nestle. You'll also see a chat button. Uh, please only use this if you've got a technical query regarding the webinar. And once again, we're going to use Slido. Uh, don't forget, uh, using a smartphone is actually the easiest way to access that using the camera. Uh, and more on that process from Tim in a little while. So that's enough from me. Uh, Tim, I uh, will hand over to you now to give us an overview of our session and to introduce our guest speakers. Uh, thank you, and I'll see you at the Q&A. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Matthew, and uh, welcome everybody here today. Um, so my name is Tim Hopkin. Uh, I'm the founder of the Land App. And, yeah, it's a real pleasure to be putting on this webinar series and, and being with you all today. So it's Andy Griffiths, um, the head of Lead Chain Sustainability at Nestle, who will be presenting on understanding and leveraging business interests in multifunctional landscapes. And then followed by um, Andy Brown, who's head of sustainability at Anglian Water, and Richard Reynolds, who's the senior, senior agronomy advisor at Anglian Water, who will be presenting on why we need resilient ecosystems and Anglian Water perspective. But before we get going with that, for those who uh, are regulars to the webinar, we'll know that we're about to do a um, a quick uh, oh, let's just see if I can get this thing, a quick Slido. So um, today we've got a question that's been playing on our minds. We're really keen to know who you think are the most inspirational characters within the land management sector. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to send out to all of you a link. Um, for Slido, so you should see all of that. Um, you should see that popping up in the chat function, in the uh, which you'll see at the bottom of your of your Zoom screens. So if you just hit um, chat, open that link up, click it, and then hit Escape on Zoom, or hit Escape on Zoom, and then open the link, you'll come <laughs> Charlie Barrel. Um, you'll see uh, Zoom open up on your computer. Alternatively, sorry, not Zoom, um, Slido. Alternatively, with your phone. Use the um, focus on the QR code, which you can see uh, on the screen, um, and then you should be able to answer on on your um, on your on your phone. So, just going to quickly change my screen over. Hopefully, you can see. 
me still. So brilliant. So Prince Charles, Prince Charles, Charlie Burrell, Gabe Brown. We had a feeling Gabe might come up. Isabella Tree, Charlie Burrell, Prince Charles. Um, I think you can still see my screen fine. Okay, brilliant. David Hill, one of our presenters. There we go, obviously upping his profile. Um, Prince Charles, Game Wildlife Conservation Trust, Jeremy Moody, okay, from the CAV, fantastic. James Rebanks, Jake Fines, interesting. Of course, Isabella Tree and Charlie Burrell are doing pretty well, aren't they? Um, something to do with her book, I'm sure. Um, Flag, Net, Forest TV, brilliant. So for those who are struggling, by the way, um, if you just, um, in the chat function, if you just um, click on that, you'll see a link that I pasted out. And all you need to do is just uh, click on that and then you can open that up in your browser and then you can answer in there. So 83 people have responded, 87. Prince Charles is really very much leading the way. Uh, this is brilliant. Okay, we'll give it another few seconds. Um, also, you're able to answer as many times as you want. So if you've got a few people on your mind, feel free to keep answering. Um, Jenny Phelps coming to the front. Brilliant. All right. Fantastic. We'll get to just over 100 and I think we'll pause there. Fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Well, um, that's very useful and we'll make um, these answers available afterwards. So, um, yes, as you'll see on, on LinkedIn. So thank you for that. I'm going to now stop sharing my screen and I'm going to um, hand over to uh, Andy Griffiths, who, as I say, is Head of S uh, Value Chain Sustainability at Nestle, who will be presenting on understanding and leveraging business interests in multifunctional landscapes. So, Andy Griffiths, I will hand over to you. If you just, uh, there you are, and just unmute yourself, go. Andy. Brilliant, Excellent. thank you. Okay, so uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, very glad to, to be here. Obviously joined many of the preceding uh, sessions and, and looking forward to speaking today. So uh, what I'll be talking about today is the importance of, of multifunctional landscapes, uh, both from a Nestle perspective, but also how we can work together to leverage uh, business interests and drive investment and support back into uh, both creating or recreating and maintaining healthy landscapes. So from a, a Nestle perspective, we've been very much focused on uh, environmental sustainability for, for many years. Um, and obviously one of the core elements for us has been about how we manage our operation. And clearly, as you can see within our operation, we've been made significant strides. These numbers are specific to the, the UK and Ireland. Uh, in terms of both reducing uh, our greenhouse gas emissions per tonne uh, by over 60%, uh, and similarly in terms of, uh, of water consumption as well. But we clearly recognise that actually our primary focus needs to be across the value chain as a whole, and actually our operational impact uh, is still a component uh, of that, and actually the, the biggest areas of, of focus and interest are very much in our, our supply uh, side of our, our business. Now, many would think that that is principally uh, around carbon emissions. Uh, and clearly that is an important aspect. We've committed to delivering uh, net zero uh, impact by 2050 uh, in line with the size-based targets initiative. Uh, and within the UK, we're looking at how we can deliver that on a much faster time scale. Um, so that is clearly important to us, but actually there are a number of other elements that are also really critical to us beyond just carbon. And they're primarily driven around business risk. And I think if uh, anything, as a result of, uh, of the current COVID crisis, one of the things that it has driven for a number of organisations is a critical review of where their other exposures may be and how they can build resilience within their organisation. And clearly for us, building resilience uh, across our supply chain and across the communities within which we operate is, is absolutely crucial. And you can see here from a UK perspective, a couple of reasons why. So on the, the left-hand graph, that's uh, some modeling from, from the aqueduct tool, uh, which shows the, the current water risk uh, profile across the UK. And as you can see, we have a number of our, our operations based in or close to some of those areas of, of high water risk. Uh, and similarly, on the right hand side, when you look at some of the challenges that we're facing into in the UK regarding soil uh, condition, 
clearly there are a number of challenges uh, and unfortunately some of those areas which are currently showing as red are areas where we currently uh, source our, our grains from to, to support the, the different businesses within the UK. So for us, clearly we need to help and support farmers and land managers in those areas to help build uh, the right multifunctional landscapes uh, to deliver resilience for us uh, and our supply chain help deliver resilience for, for those farmers, for those land managers, and, and support the development of their business models in the future. Uh, but also look at how we can bring together a range of other businesses and other organisations to deliver a broad range of outcomes. So ensure that those, those landscapes are genuinely multifunctional in their nature, and that we're not just biasing them towards, for example, carbon or towards uh, water quality or water flow. So that, that's a really important element for, for us as a business. And clearly in terms of managing that, it's important that we deliver those range of outcomes. So some of them will be very much uh, in terms of habitat, in terms of soil quality. But the other key thing we mustn't forget is we need that land to deliver food production as well going forwards. If you look at the forecasts from WRI uh, and from uh, UNFAO, uh, the current forecasts are if we continue on a business as usual basis, we'll need somewhere between 60 and 70 percent additional food uh, from the land to support uh, citizens globally. So clearly we need to help make decisions which improve the state of nature, improve those landscapes, but also enable us to continue to deliver and fulfill those food demands going forwards. And for us, there are three core elements uh, helping or we need to focus on to help us achieve that. One is food waste uh, and how we address some of the food waste challenges uh, within our own operation. Actually, the level of food waste is, is relatively small. Uh, the larger component is, is in our up, uh, up chain supply, uh, but also uh, the consumer end as well. So working very much on reducing that food waste looking at how we can rebalance uh, protein consumption, protein use within our diets, which again can help reduce the pressure on land, um, which will improve the, the situation going forwards. And then the third and really important component, which is principally what I wanna talk about today, is regenerative agriculture and how we support and enable that to grow and deliver the right kind of outcomes. And again, as I touched on, rather than focusing on particular outcomes, we're very much focused on ensuring that we have multifunctional landscapes and that we understand the interrelationship between soil, water, habitat and carbon, uh, and that we have landscapes which can deliver across those different aspects. So when we looked at this, uh, we were trying to unpick why if resiliency uh, and if the state of nature is uh, such critical challenges, why aren't more businesses uh, investing into those propositions? So probably about uh, three, four years ago, uh, I was having some discussion with, with Tom Curtis from uh, Three Keel, who presented in uh, session two uh, in the series. Uh, to really kind of unpick and understand that. And we did some work where we started to talk to a range of uh, peers, both within the sector, but also outside the sector, to understand from their perspectives why those investments weren't being made. A number of themes came out, but one really shone through, and it was very much about the approach. And principally, what we tend to do as organisations, whether as special interest groups, NGOs, conservation bodies, uh, or, or even business as well, we tend to start with a spatial location, identify the primary issues, structure up a set of proposals to address those issues, and then, and only then, go to business and try to convince them to, to fund these propositions. And the real challenge with that kind of approach is typically those proposals don't align with the core business interests or the business struggles to understand how it aligns and therefore we struggle to get the investment. If we do get investment, typically it's, it's small scale CSR payments uh, as opposed to genuine sustainable payment to, to support the model going forwards. So what we did from that was we started to unpick and try and understand what are the key drivers that would help bring 
organisations on board to invest in and support the development uh, of uh, these, uh, these interventions uh, within the landscape. And there are a number of key elements that, that came out of that. The, the first one was clearly we need independent governance. So if we start with a spatial location, clearly we need to ensure that whatever decisions are made fit within the national framework, the national expectations. But in reality, it's the local decision makers, uh, those people who live within that region who really understand where the primary challenges, primary opportunities are. So it's important whether you call it catchment system operator in line with the Natural Capital Committee's recommendations or something else. It's important that we have that independent governance body who can look at that particular region, do uh, the analysis uh, and actually identify what are the key requirements, where are the key gaps within that landscape. You can use a range of different tools to achieve that. I won't go into the detail of, of what they look like. But as a result of that, ultimately produce that, that asset register or that plan detailing uh, what the core requirements are, taking into consideration both business interests and the interests of civil society. So it's very much a balanced proposition. And then separately, we would then look at a model which actually focuses on the financing and delivery against those requirements. And this is really where we started to, to build out what, what was needed. And there are a number of core elements there. The first one was we need to start demand side. We need to understand what the business interests are. Uh, and within that, we need to separate out payment for goods and payment for services. Once you do that, it enables sectors beyond just agri-food to step in and engage as well. If all we ever do is pay a premium on the, the commodities that we procure, it limits the amount of businesses who can step into that space. The second piece is how we assess. So it's important that when we talk to businesses, we really focus on risk and opportunity. When we talk about impacts, it can be quite a negative discussion for a number of businesses and they will potentially withdraw from that conversation. All businesses have a really strong interest in where their current exposures sit, where their risks sit, and what they need to do to manage those. So if we talk the language of risk, it's a very engaging proposition for those businesses, and it's much easier to bring them on board and help construct a proposition to address those, those risks. The next piece is aggregation. So again, provide an opportunity to bring together all those different business interests. Uh, there are a number of benefits. One is obviously it helps drive a much more multifunctional outcome by bringing those different interests together. But also there's a number of efficiencies. Firstly, scale. The more organisations, funding organisations we can bring together, the bigger the pot, the more efficient the, the delivery. The second piece is multifunctional outcomes. So if we only specify outcomes and not interventions, we know that the interventions that are delivered will not only deliver those primary outcomes, but will deliver a range of secondary outcomes effectively for free. And also we get density of implementation. One of the big challenges with value chain approach is that if I look at all my farmers, uh, although we can help incentivize and support them, they may be quite well distributed across the landscape and therefore the impact of those interventions heavily diluted. If we can aggregate up not just the demand side, but the supply side as well, bringing together a group of farmers and land managers, it means we can have much denser implementation within the landscape. And finally, approach. Uh, it needs to be uh, accessible. One of the core challenges with, for example, reverse auction is it tends to lock out the smaller players and favours the larger players who have the headroom, the capacity to build the, the proposition. So if we can aggregate up those, those uh, smaller players, then it enables them to put forward a combined proposition and enables them to play in that space. Uh, and it also needs to be appropriate. We need to provide a solution which enables farmers and land managers to determine with the support of credible and uh, highly experienced uh, advisors to identify which interventions are appropriate for their farm, for their business, but which will still deliver the outcomes that the demand side need. So that, that was the proposition. And as a result of that, that's how we started to develop the, the landscape enterprise network model. So I don't intend to go into the detail of that. If anyone's uh, interested uh, and wasn't on the, uh, the session, you can dive back into 
uh, episode two, where, where Tom very eloquently talked about the, the landscape enterprise network model and how that works. But for us, we're really clear that that's an open source model. It's not a Nestle model. It's an open source model that can be used to leverage and embed the interests of, of business into landscape, help drive that investment into the landscape to deliver not only environmental outcomes, but to build resiliency within the community, build economic and social uh, outcomes within that community. And what we wanted to do was make sure that this wasn't just rhetoric, but we tested it as well. So as a business, Nestle, we draw down about 8% of Scottish dairy, about 2% of UK dairy as a whole. Uh, so we built a proposition with our dairy farmers uh, to look at how this could be evolved. Um, and we started that work about three years ago with a number of uh, advisors, some of them who are on the call today. Um, and really pleased to say that although we targeted what we thought was quite an ambitious level of trying to engage about 60% of our dairy farmers in those uh, or in the programme, actually for, for the last two years with the support of our advisors, um, First Milk as the cooperative, uh, we've seen every single one of those uh, farmers delivering nature-based solutions uh, within the landscape. What we're also doing is working with academic partners, so the N8 uh, agri-food team, looking at how we both assess and develop the lens model itself, but also looking at the complex interrelationships between interventions and outcomes. So what are the impacts on not just crop health, soil health, but also animal health? Are there trade-offs and how do we best manage those? And as you can see here, Tom again in the previous session, talked about the lens laboratories uh, across the UK. We're continuing to see them grow rapidly. Um, and what you can see here is the green blobs represent the areas where we as a business, Nestle has a core interest, typically from a sourcing or possibly from an operational perspective. But as you can see, we're seeing a number of gray blobs uh, also building out where we have a range of other organizations stepping into the uh, space and looking to uh, collaborate and convene to invest back into, uh, into those landscapes. So that's a, a quick summary of, uh, of our interests of business and also how we're, we're trying to work together with a range of business interests, with NGOs, uh, with advisory partners to, to really build a credible model that can deliver multifunctional landscapes at scale, both within the UK, but also in the longer term beyond the UK. So without further ado, I shall uh, hand back. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Andy. A hugely informative um, talk, as always. Um, so now we have Andy Brown and Richard Reynolds from Anglian Water, who are going to be presenting on why we need resilient ecosystems and Anglian Water perspective. So, Andy and Richard, over to you. Thanks very much, Tim, and uh, really a pleasure to be here. So, um, I'm just going to talk to you. Uh, I'm Andy Brown. I'm going to talk to you very quickly to give you a kind of an overview, a high level um kind of background to, to why we think you know we really absolutely need resilient ecosystems to deliver you know our core services and then i'm going to hand over to richard who's going to give you some examples of some of the collaborative work that, that uh, we've been doing with the agricultural community so rich do you want to switch on to the next slide um so just to kind of give you that kind of long-term background so as a, as a as a water company we obviously work over fairly long uh time scales and although we, we work on a five year kind of detailed kind of management plan, uh, business plan approach, we're actually looking at, at much longer horizons. Um, and, and what we've seen through the kind of conversations with stakeholders uh, and uh, with customers, particularly kind of in that 25 year horizon uh, in developing what we call our strategic uh, direction statement is, is a number of things really coming to the fore in terms of those long term objectives. And, and those are the, the four things listed up on the kind of top left hand corner. And two of them are particularly relevant to this and, and very much driven by the common challenges that we all face around, you know, changing climate, the, the climate crisis that we're experiencing you know, before COVID hit us, and, uh, but also the kind of how to deal with a growing population in, in, the, uh, in the UK and particularly in the east of England. So the top one, resilient to the risks of drought and flooding, you know, ensuring that the east of England and not just us, the whole east of England are resilient, it's really important. And then the last one there, 
working with others to achieve significant improvement to ecological quality across our catchments. These are things that have come out from our consultation with customers as being hugely important that we've got a massive role to play, but we can't deliver that on our own. And just to kind of put it into the kind of context of, of how important this has become to us as a company, you know, we have always felt that that what what we do, the services that we deliver, are beyond the kind of normal kind of business realm. You know, water is so important, so vital to everybody, and in the community, in the region, to our environment, you know, to to, to the wealth and, and well-being of our communities. That we work in the public interest to deliver that service. But I don't think it was always seen like that. So actually what our board did last July was take it, take the commitment kind of to the next level and actually embed purpose into our articles of association, the core document that governs how we manage our company. And, and in, in the blue box, that's, that's the kind of shorthand version of our purpose now, which is to bring environmental and social prosperity to the region we serve through our commitment to love every drop. And love every drop is the, is the kind of way we, we articulate this. Um, so to, to, to be able to do that, we've got to be able to understand how we're influencing, you know, that, that wider landscape and how we make decisions um, based on something more than financial considerations and, and, and the kind of final outputs of our kind of manufactured capital. And in developing something that we're doing at the moment with our customers, which is which we're calling a social contract, um, we've been looking at some additional commitments. And one of those commitments is around um, our, our business plan outcome of investing for tomorrow, which is about incorporating a wider set of values in our decision making kind of framework. And, and that's what we're, we call the six capitals. And what's particularly relevant kind of to today's discussion is, is how we think about natural capital, both within our business. And, and the decisions that we make as a company, but actually much more importantly, how that influences the wider management of landscape and how that influences the things that we need to do to deliver our, our vital service. So from a natural capital perspective at, at Anglian Water, we've been doing a lot of work looking at the, the kind of, uh, the, the same things that, that Andy was just showing on those slides, the impacts on, on uh, carbon, the impacts on biodiversity, the impacts on soils. Um, and we've been developing kind of some baseline assessments of biodiversity across our across our asset base. Um, but our board wanted us to go further and understand what the implications of us managing our our sites, our assets, our operations um, would have on the wider regional baseline. So a little while ago, we undertook a, a piece of work with the University of East Anglia to look at kind of what, what would an asset register, what would a, what would some sort of baseline for natural capital look like for the whole of the east of England. Um, and that piece of work was done and published it and that's on our website and, and you can go and have a look at that. It's all kind of open source uh, data. Um, but that led us to the conclusion that we needed to work with a greater range of organisations to understand this and to find some like minded businesses, particularly and going back to Andy's point, you know, businesses are critical in this if we want to kind of change, um, you know, change a kind of collaborative approach. So um, building on some fantastic work that, that we've been involved with uh, with many other kind of organizations which is something called um, uh, water resources east which is a multi-sector uh, approach to long-term water resource planning across the east of england a very different approach to to managing and thinking about water resources than we used to we we've started to bring a group of organizations together under the banner of natural capital east and that's to start looking at you know what are a set of metrics and a baseline um, uh, and, a, and a, a kind of way of thinking about natural capital at a regional scale, what does that look like and what benefits will that bring um, a kind of whole host of different organisations? Now this is in its infancy, but um, it's something we're, we're developing with a number of different businesses and with some local enterprise partnerships and with input from, from a number of organisations to think about you know, how we might change the way we, we monitor, we, we think about, we manage natural capital at the landscape scale to kind of create a much more collaborative approach to some of the challenges that we, that we face. Uh, I haven't got time to kind of go into the detail of that today. So what I'm gonna do now is actually hand over to Richard who is gonna take us through some of the examples of where we have been working um, collaboratively with agriculture, and, and, and other land managers on some of the specific issues that, that kind of 
cross boundaries and impact our ability to deliver our vital services. Richard, over to you. Well, thanks, Andy. Um, so uh, I joined Angling Water about six years ago. I felt like it was a fairly unusual in the company that I came from an agricultural background rather than a more engineering. And what really struck me was that the water industry is a very traditional sector in terms of the infrastructure that it's got in a lot of materials and, and, and facilities have been in for 20, 30, 50 years. Approaches tend to be fairly conservative, tend to be very risk averse. And you know, that's really important because we're providing such a vital service, we can't afford things to go wrong. But it does mean that often processes lack that flexibility to be fleet of foot, to embrace new ideas, new ways of doing things. And, and often the new ways of doing things are exactly where we want to be going. So, you know, there's a preference for engineered solutions that can have a, a dialed in certainty rather than the more environmentally based services that, that are far more difficult to put a fixed number of certainty onto. And what was really interesting was that even six years ago, I could see that, that the company's approach was, was moving more to kind of considering, well, what sort of other alternatives could we look at in terms of managing some of the big issues? So uh, I was brought in to look after the agriculture team and our primary focus was uh, a pesticide called metaldehyde. I'm sure some of you on the call are familiar with it. Other, others aren't, it's the active ingredient in slug pellets. Um, and as a pesticide, it's the single biggest challenge to angling water. It's not a health-based challenge, but drinking water standard compliance means we need to get to 0 0.1 micrograms per liter for any pesticide in the drinking water. That's a kind of throwaway number, but practically that's the equivalent of one M&M in an in a Olympic-sized drinking, uh, sorry, Olympic-sized swimming pool. Um, one stem of hay in 111,000 bales, one grain of wheat in 390 tons. It is an absolutely you know, staggeringly small number, but those are the standards that we are, we are held to. The problem is that metaldehyde, for all practical purposes, is untreatable. So we face the challenge of a pesticide that can't be engineered away, but we're also having massive issues. And in 2014, we had 50 failures on, on metaldehyde. Um, as I said, it wasn't a health-based standard, but in terms of our, our standards that we need to stick to is, it is a really major significance. So um, the first step that we took in, the engineers got involved and they were very pleased. It was up, uh, we built a new reservoir called Hall. We couldn't build it legally uh, we couldn't build a facility that was only non-compliant from, from the start. So this was to provide resilience for Lincoln. It wasn't a massive facility, uh, engineered for 20 megalitres a day. By comparison, Anglian Water serving over 1,000 megalitres a day. So uh, relatively small, but the problem was that we couldn't have any metaldehyde failures. Now, Hall was a really uh, interesting engineering challenge. And our engineers, I don't know what half the things are in this box here, but essentially all of those went into this very small building in, in the center. It cost us 42 million pounds to build. What was really important about that number is if we scale it up to hit the facilities that we would need to provide treatment of metaldehyde across the Anglian region, that's 600 million pounds to scale that up, which in the current environment, let alone six years ago, wasn't even vaguely economically feasible. So the business had to really step to one side and say, well, can we take a new perspective? Can we look at this challenge in a different way? Instead of trying to engineer a way out of solutions, can we look at what uh, the business talked about as, a, as an innovative solution of catchment management, but can we look beyond the gates of the treatment works and kind of get to understand, well, why these products have been used and can we work with the uh, you know, outside to actually get a solution to the internal. And that's where our uh, catchment management program was born and a project that we, yeah. So a project that we call Slug It Out. Uh, and essentially that involved building a team of people that weren't from the water industry. Um, it won't surprise you to know our HR department was moderately perturbed when I said I didn't want somebody from a water industry background. What we really needed if we were gonna to talk to agriculture was people that had technical credibility so if you're talking about pesticides, make sure you've got a basis certificate so you can talk those sort of languages. Make sure that you're aware of the social dynamics on the farm. So whether it be the difference between green and blue tractors, whether it be understanding what crop is in the ground, this is not an area where our scientists, brilliant as they are, 
really have the have the kind of remit to add. Uh, it's really focusing on making sure that we've got the uh, uh, making sure the right people. We took a tier two tiered approach. So the first area was looking at abstraction management, which was those areas where we could switch our pumps on and off, making sure that uh, our our managers, our uh, supply managers, had a good understanding of what was happening on the ground, so they had the best information. So when we knew there was a metaldehyde risk, we took the, turned the pumps off. We didn't bring the water in, but if we did, uh, if we didn't know that there were, if there wasn't a challenge to metaldehyde, we could keep pumping. But that didn't necessarily apply in all areas. So around our reservoirs, we can't control what's going into them. So we needed to do a different plan. And that's where we launched the program called Slug It Out. This was essentially targeted around each of our reservoirs. Uh, at its, at its uh, peak, we were focusing on eight catchments. We were talking to 213 farmers, um, covering 23,500 hectares of land. And one of the key aims we had was, although a lot of other water companies were saying, yeah, you probably need 60 to 7% uptake. Our concern is if we're going to be doing a scheme, we should be aiming to get 100% uptake because if one person doesn't necessarily follow the scheme, because metaldehyde so little can cause a problem, if the farmer at the top of the catchment has a, uses metaldehyde and has an issue, all the benefits further down the catchment are going to be negatively impacted. So we set the challenge of 100% uptake, which gives far more social challenges than it does necessary logistics. Uh, we offered the farmers essentially a three-tiered payment, involved a hosting fee because we're running a trial and, and we're getting a lot of information from them, a direct substitution and what we call the water quality bonus, which was an incentive at the end if we get it, if we achieve what we need, well, they've been part of the solution. And that's very much where we would like to move to in the future. It is rewarding for outcomes rather than doing a relatively simple approach. And it's really about building those sort of scenario beyond metaldehyde. If we look at this as just a tool for metaldehyde, we've lost a huge opportunity. So we're looking to build those resilient long-term partnerships that Andy was alluding, well, Andy number one was alluding to at the beginning. Um, so the scheme we did was great. But what difference did it make? And it was really important to understand that to the business, getting the metaldehyde down to below 0.1 was really important, but there's all sorts of other measures of success that were just as important. First one was that 100% uptake. It was a voluntary scheme and it always is a voluntary scheme, but for the five years that we've run it, we've had every single farm around every single catchment sign up to it, which means that there's something there that's building that credibility. We've also had 64% of the farmers try some element of cultural control. So considering options other than just reaching for a, for a bottle of chemical, which is absolutely what we want. Uh, for the uh, folk inside the company, we had a 98% reduction in metaldehyde from the levels that we saw in 2014. So really good practical benefits. And probably the thing that I'm most proud of is that when we talked to the farmers and said, well, we've been subsidizing just around the land in our reservoirs, but is there any other areas that based on what you learned, you would be prepared to use it? And we've had 1,000, well, sorry, 13,500 hectares of land that we're not paying any subsidy to do, but the farmers are deciding to use it. Now, I think that's about the wider message that we're doing and it's certainly where we want to be moving in the future. But it doesn't always work fine. And I think one of the most important thing is to recognize that when the systems, when the plans are put together, it's an opportunity when it doesn't work to uh, learn and to refine what we're doing. So we find areas where there was agricultural sources of metaldehyde over five years and, and the number of farmers that we had that wasn't surprising. Uh, but we also found urban sources. So sometimes allotments for sources, sometimes gardens and those sort of things. And it's important to keep your, your eyes open and realize that we're working with a natural system. We're not necessarily going to engineer our way through every solution, um, but also don't discount options. Uh, so the more we learn, the more we do, the more we refine the system. But I think sometimes we try and refine it too much or we maybe lose an opportunity. Uh, so those are the difference that it makes. And I think I would very much encourage anybody that's working with Anglian Water, think of measures of success. What are the, other than the primary one, what are the secondary measures that we might be doing? As I said, things like voluntary uptake and cultural controls were really important in this trial the other work that we're doing, there will be other measures and, you know, understanding that it is, is really important to, to emphasizing the value of these sort of more holistic approaches. So looking forward, um, 
I think one of the most important things that we've done through the five years of being involved with Slugged Art is we've earned an element of credibility. We're never going to be ahead of that game there. We're always going to be learning. and We're always going to be talking. But we've earned the right to at least have a conversation. And I think if we get nothing else, that, that's important. We've earned the, the right to start talking about bigger things. So um, one of the approaches that we have underlying everything, and if you look at the Slugged Art logo, it has healthy crops, healthy water. One of the things we're evolving our approach to do is healthy crops, healthy soils, healthy water. Because soils, soil health, soil management, I think is, is a fundamental that is going to be driving what we're doing going forward. Um, and it delivers so many different benefits across the business. It needs refinement, it needs locally targeting, and certainly a lot of things we do needs to be relevant to angling water um, for us to be able to support it. But very much we want to be engaged. And, and a lot of you will look at this picture and just say, well, this is a picture of somebody digging a hole. When I show these slides to people in Anglia Water, this is the most important picture, the one in the center, because the guy in the hole, hole there is uh, Peter Simpson, who's our CEO. And to show that the man in charge of the company is quite happy to get his hands dirty, to understand that aspect is really important in building our credibility internally, but it also shows that he gets this wider understanding of catchment management and, and essentially what Andy has alluded to. So in summary, essentially our learnings from catchment management that we're looking to take forward is, is firstly understand the problem. And one of the things that really resonates for me here was when I talked to a farmer at the beginning of Slug It Out and was talking about metaldehyde problem. And he said to me, young man, you've got to remember one thing here that metaldehyde is Anglian Waters problem. Slugs are my problem. And one of the big things that we're doing now is really understanding the context of things. We don't have the right to talk about things in our world. We need to be understanding from other people's perspectives and how they see it. The second half is embracing, innov embracing innovation. You know, there, there are, everybody's got different ideas on the farm. You're seeing things in different perspectives and in different ways. And there's multiple ways to achieve things. So cultural controls, chemical controls, there's multiple ways of working against the slugs. Um, and probably the important final one is that we want to have business to business conversations. Anglian Water is a commercial business. Agriculture is a commercial business. There are drivers that we both have, the constraints that we both have, but we can work together for these solutions. And as we look at the environment bill, we look at the agriculture bill, and we also look at the challenges that, agriculture, that the water industry's got. There's, there's a lot more opportunities to work together. So yeah, that's it from, from my side. So uh, back to you, Tim unless Andy Brown's got anything to add. Brilliant, thank you, Richard. Andy, any more to add? No, I think that, that was you a, a, yourself. Yeah, no, that was a, 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 great, a, a great example. Thanks, Richard. Fantastic. Well, guys, thank you so much. And it's always just so impressive to see Anglian Water really leading from the front. So, you know, as much as we can make available sort of what you're up to, uh, you know, be an absolute pleasure. So, yeah, thank you so much for that very informative presentation. Um, so next we have um, a couple uh, of questions uh, from um, both of the Andes. So we're just going to do another Slido now. So I'm just going to uh, grab Andy Griffith's uh, question, and I'm just going to paste that down into the chat function to everybody. So hopefully you're getting used to this now. Just into the chat function, uh, take the link, and let's uh, go through into Slido. So Andy's question is, um, so Andy Griffith's question, beyond funding, what is the key enabler in delivering multifunctional landscapes, networks, I guess that's people networks, stability, knowledge. So for those of you um, who maybe haven't answered yet, just um, in Zoom, if you hit escape, you can then hit the, uh, the chat button, and then in there you can take the, the link and paste it into your browser, or alternatively, uh, get your, your phone out, take a picture of this QR code, and then you'll be able to answer the questions on your phone in Slido and then we'll filter through here. So Andy Griffith's question, so beyond funding, what is the key enabler in delivering multifunctional landscapes? Communication, networks, knowledge, understanding, this is becoming a very consistent theme throughout this webinar series, that the key component that everyone is craving is communication, knowledge, and education. Trust, yep, interesting. So I guess that's an outcome of, of the network and the shared learning shared interests, catchment partnership, cooperation, willingness to learn, but communication, collaboration, and knowledge, absolutely front and center. Okay. 
And also in the feedback forms that we send in the emails, please do answer those and give us your thoughts and ideas of what we could be doing more of. We really want to help facilitate this network and grow the conversation and support everyone as much as we can. Brilliant. Thank you, everyone. Um, I think we'll leave it uh, there for now. And we'll go through into Andy Brown's question. So if I now take that and share that and put that through the chat function. So um, here we go. So Andy Brown's question is just coming through. I'll hit go live and I'll go into present mode. So again, just uh, jump into the chat button, scoop out that link. Um, and for those that are sort of answering in the chat, please, please do try and grab the link because that's what flows it through into here. So Andy Brown's question, how could utilities work more effectively with you? And what's the one thing you would want to collaborate on? Um, with your water company on. So how can you work more collaboratively with the utility companies? How would you work um, together? Peatland restoration. So how can you as land managers or those involved in the land management sector work more effectively with water companies? How can you get on the same page, be looking in the same direction, sharing ideas potentially, uh, making sure you're well connected? So this is a bit more varied. Okay, so soil, soil health, flood risk. Okay, brilliant. And just remember, those who are answering, answering, you can answer as many times as you want. So please do continue to share. It just um... the key things that kind of shows me how well it is is when I go across to Cumbria or Southwest Scotland, the number of non-Nestle farmers who ask me how they can come and work for us. So it's clearly having an impact. Good, good. Um, and then uh, final, final question. We will have some joint ones as well. Um, just in terms of your, I suppose, as a, as a business, what do you feel has been the most uh, impressive um, sort of idea from a sustainability point of view for, for, for the business? Let's start, there's, there's a whole range really. Um, I think lends itself as, you know, as a potential proposition is, is really exciting. Um, one of, from an agricultural perspective, uh, some of the most interesting ones, we've been doing a lot of work in, uh, in France with uh, AgriCircle and INRA and Earthworm in terms of soil sampling and actually determining at a very high level of resolution the, the levels of, of soil carbon, organic soil content and soil condition. Uh, so that's been interesting. And at a larger scale working with, again, Earthworm, who were the Forest Trust, uh, and Airbus uh, to develop Project Starling, which is a system where we can use a whole raft of di digital information to give us near real-time insight in terms of deforestation. So we can see it happening almost instantaneously and then take action. So although the likes of sophistication is really important, having something like Starling where we can then take direct action has been incredibly valuable and, yeah. and should be even more valuable going forward. Yeah, so real-time monitoring. Yeah. Andy, thank you. I'm going to turn to uh, Andy and Richard now, if I may. I'll just uh, change pages. Um, just uh, one question that came in, uh, the first one was, was really just looking backwards slightly. It's easy to keep looking forwards, but just looking backwards to the impact of the winter flooding. From a, from a natural capital perspective uh, in, in your area, do you, do you feel that's had a big impact on natural capital, the flooding this year? Uh, I saw that question actually um, coming out. Uh, it's a really interesting one and I'm, I'm not sure I've got an answer for it, particularly um, being kind of trapped within the, the confines of my home for the last two months and not really being able to get out and have a, have a look more than uh, a couple of hundred uh, yards or so from the house. Um, I, I think we're going to have to wait and see and it does depend on, you know, there will be some things that have been impacted by the flooding, but then there are going to be some things that have been positively kind of impacted um, from the from the flooding because you've got to remember that flooding is a natural part of the of the system you know and, and actually for some natural capital f flooding is a really important element i live um just outside huntingdon and we're lucky enough to have all our natural flood meadows still here so port home meadow which is a special area of conservation and internationally important flood meadow st ives flood meadows which I was amazed, you know, during recent flooding to, to make it onto, um, I think it was the Daily Telegraph, um, amazing aerial picture saying, oh my God, look at this flooding. Well, yeah, that's what it's supposed to do. That's part of the natural system. Uh, Richard, I don't know whether you've got any kind of direct examples from, from your team. Uh, not that I could think of directly, but I think I, I, I would emphasize that, you know, we're working in natural systems. Uh, in some respects, 
we've engineered and we're looking at, at single solutions. So, you know, even, even the slug it out scheme was initially focused purely on metaldehyde. I think the evolution of approaches, regardless of where you are, is recognizing we're working within a system. So the things that we're talking about, and there's a lot of work around cover crops. Now, for me, well, cover crops can be focused around a particular measure, but there are a lot of other benefits. There's a natural capital benefit. There's a nutrient loss benefit. There's a sedimentation loss benefit. And I think the next evolution is, is looking at these multiple benefits and, and recognizing those sort of things and, and also recognizing the dynamics of local, local landscapes and, and what features are there outside the pure production areas. And I think often solutions tend to be focused on this is this field of rape. So we'll only look there rather than looking where it fits into that landscape. Um, just in terms of, of that, I suppose, that integrated approach, um, natural capital, one comment's come in, natural capital East is a, is a, is a really exciting project and uh, it's, it's a really good way of embedding uh, natural capital within the business model. What opportunities do you feel there are to disseminate that across the wider sort of water industry network? And, and that kind of cuts across uh, both, both talks, actually, because, you know, particularly, the, you know, the, for the water company, water companies typically, I mean, you have vested interests in, in often multiple landscapes. So um, how, how do you feel this can be rolled out? Yeah, and that's really one of the primary reasons that, that we got involved in this, because, you know, we, we could see the emergence of uh, kind of natural capital mapping and the opportunity of natural capital investment plans. Um, you know, there's, there's uh, interesting work that's been done in Manchester, and I know there's interesting work being done in, in, in a number of other locations. But for us as a business that, that, that covers 14 kind of counties, what we didn't want to see was natural capital kind of mapping and metrics being developed in different forms across all of those kind of county boundaries or landscapes, because it was going to make it almost impossible for us to kind of engage with it in, in any kind of sensible form. So that was this, uh, that, that, that's really what spawned the idea. And, and it came from, as I said, Water Resources East, which has taken a similar approach to regional water resource planning. And that's brought together, you know, the water sector, the power sector, the agricultural sector, um, uh, the, the um, kind of academic sector to look at a different approach. And we saw, you know, we were involved in that. It came from Anglian Water. It's now an independent organisation helping to, to drive that forward. That's really what we want to see coming out of Natural Capital East. And it has got a, a similar kind of a subset of organizations from, well, Andy, Nestle have been involved from the start, but there are um, developers and uh, kind of infrastructure kind of companies and, and uh, uh, other utilities and a number, a, a wide range. Now, once we've got the kind of the thought process sorted out and, and have got some uh, concrete, not concrete, that's the wrong word, isn't it? <laughs> uh, other outputs to share with people. Absolutely, we want to do that. And, and we've been having a chat with kind of uh, government representatives as well on, on the, 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 the opportunity that might come from it. So it's not something we're going to kind of keep behind closed doors. We absolutely want to share it. And if people want to go and have a look at some interesting stuff, actually, go and have a look at um, what the Oxcam Arc um, have been producing so they've been developing and they're, they're part of Natural Capital East as well they've been developing the natural capital plans and opportunity maps for the Oxford to Cambridgeshire development arc um, and there's some really interesting reports that they've now got online and, and you know we're working with them to see how we um, use that as a basis to drive that thinking right across the east of England. Andy I don't know if you want to add anything to that. Yeah, no, I absolutely agree. I think there's two benefits for me. One is is very much that spatial piece, so sort of bringing together actors across that that region uh, and allowing us to really kind of optimise uh, how that works and plays through. The other key element, which Andy kind of alluded to, is the the genuine cross sector nature. So again, what tends to have happened historically is the all the weight tends to land on agri food and on water utilities. Uh, to a large extent, this approach has brought in a whole range of different players from infrastructure, you know, right through to water, through to agri-food, and, and now start to see interest from, from other sectors as well playing through. So I think helping different organisations to understand what their dependencies on nature are on, are on that landscape, and then coming together to deliver change to address that is, is really, really valuable. I mean, I think, Richard, you mentioned, you touched on the need to um, 
have the, almost get the engagement right on the ground, um, you know, because that is actually the most important part, arguably, is, is delivering delivering change on the ground. And, and, you know, we can have as many agencies and businesses as we need, uh, but, but actually the most important people are, 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 the, are the direct land managers, whether it's the farmers or uh, the wildlife group or whoever it might be. Yeah, I, th I think it's recognising that if, in some respects, we talk about farmers and, uh, you know, even Andy said, oh, we've got our farmers. And one of the things I always try and remind people is that there's no such thing as a farmer. There's old farmers, there's young farmers, there's conservative farmers, there's very proactive farmers. And we need to recognize that different approaches and different things will be important to those different groups. Economics, you know, we, we've came to come through a very challenging winter and people will be in a very different situation and receptive to to different messages and, and have different needs compared to if we come through a balmy season and everything was lovely. There's a lot of uncertainty coming through, uh, whether it be potentially losing actors, whether it be legal changes, whether it be subsidies, all of that sort of stuff. There, there's a huge amount of uncertainty. And I very much think that there's an opportunity here for the likes of these sort of more joined up approaches, the likes of looking at natural capital as, as, as it's a great opportunity that we're certainly moving into, but we need to remember the context within which we're talking to people. We need to earn the right to talk to farmers. We need to also remember that they get their advice. They trust a different group. So don't forget the likes of the agronomists and, and where that credibility is. You know, I said that as an Anglian water catchment team, I think it's taken us five years to earn that credibility. We can't walk in and expect it. it it's a process that needs to come through with trust and that sort of stuff. And, and I think certainly on the catch and management experience, it, it's all about that side. It's that earned credibility rather than this is who we are, so you need to listen to us. Um, and there are multiple actors, the, the retailers, all the sort of people that are, that are involved in these conversations. Yeah, so it's a collaborative approach, which is the, uh, the intent of this uh, webinar series. So um, I'm going to draw, uh, draw a question to a close there. We've got to say we haven't, we've got more, more questions than we've got time to answer. So what we'll do is make sure that they are answered offline and available to everybody. So uh, thank you to all of our guest speakers today. Um, and thank you everybody for, for, for joining us. Um, we do record the sessions, so they'll be uploaded to our website in due course. And next week's seminar, it's a nice segue, we're, we're doing re regenerative agriculture next week. So you'll hear more about that. And uh, we look forward to seeing as many of you as possible next week. So. Uh, Thank you, uh, Andy, Richard and Andy, for your um, time today. I uh, appreciate that. And uh, it's goodbye from Tim and I, and uh, we'll see you next week. Thank you.